people dress up on Easter Sunday, and I love that. I mean, it, it feels good to look good. Amen? Amen. And uh, I've discovered as I travel through the chronological path of life <laughs> that uh, people say I look good when I'm wearing a lot of clothing. <laughs> Now, it used to be when I was young, if I was wearing a tank top and short shorts, people would make comment about my physique. It's usually positive. But now what I found is the more clothing I put on, the more people, oh, wow, John, you look really good. And that's because I'm covering up, you know, what time has done to this poor body of mine. <laughs> Clothes do make the man, they do make the woman for sure. In fact, clothing makes, it plays a role in Scripture. Um, in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, give, God gave very specific instructions about what He wanted His people to wear and what He wanted them to wear in certain contexts. And so He says, don't wear this, but uh, you must wear that. And so, you know, clothing's been part of our worship, really. And uh, I saw a cartoon, a comic panel years ago where a wife and a husband are walking out of the church building. And the wife says, did you see Sister Smith's new shoes? And her husband goes, no, I, I'm afraid I, I didn't. Hmm, she says. Well, what about Sister Jones' new outfit? Did you see that? He goes, no, hon, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't pay attention. She goes, well, a lot of good it does you to go to church. <laughs> So next Sunday, we're going to get all dressed up, and some of you have already gone out and found your thing. Some of you have been to the dry cleaner to get your thing clean. Some of you are, like many of us, haven't gone out and done anything, so you're going to be heading to your favorite store and looking for that killer deal and the clearance rack with the beautiful whatever. And uh, when you come in next Sunday, you'll be looking and feeling good. I, I'm, I guess I am getting old, really, because... I love it when sisters wear hats. I just love it. So, you know, I, Sunday is usually a better day for hats, and I just, I just love that look. So my wife always looks good in hats. Always. So, so uh, today's really this message is about dressing for success. And um, Jesus had his own way of teaching us how to dress for success. It's not really about the world and its uh, elusive uh, status of being successful, but Jesus talks to us about how to be spiritually successful. Uh, and there's really just one condition that I want to talk about that spiritual success, and that is that we must be clothed correctly. Because at the end of time, if you are going to be allowed into heaven, it's going to be because you're clothed with Christ. So I'd like you to open your Bibles to Matthew 22, please. We'll be looking at the parable of the wedding feast. That's in Matthew in the 22nd chapter. Let's read that together, okay? And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, Now, if you want to know who them is, go up a couple verses. Doesn't take long to realize he's talking to the Pharisees. And this isn't going well, because in verse 46 of chapter 21, it says they want to arrest him, but they couldn't because the people thought he was a prophet. So it's pretty tense, getting very uh, a lot of conflict building up here in Matthew 22 and following. Jesus is telling this parable really directed at the Pharisees. Look what he says. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner and my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Verse 5, but they paid no attention and they went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. 
Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main rows and invite them to the wedding feast, as many as you can find. And those servants went out on the roads, and they gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Verse 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Fred, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14. For many are called, but few are. On that day, that great final day, we must be found wearing the correct attire. Why was the man expelled? Well, protocol and propriety of the day was that if you uh, were at a wedding, you must wear a wedding garment, okay? It's sort of like going to a really fancy wedding and somebody's showing up and cut off some flip-flops. Mm. Outside, of, outside of California, that's not cool. I'll just let you know. You know, it's kind of strange what happens when you move back into this state. People are showing up in pajamas everywhere. No, I, I mean, airports, shopping malls, and, you know, fuzzy slippers and pajamas and you know back east that that just looks wrong to a lot of people but anyway in this day if you went if a king especially if a king invited you to his son the prince's wedding feast you know you must wear a wedding garment and uh and the uh, hospitality of the day if someone didn't own a wedding garment uh, then the host would provide one so that explains why he was speechless because he had what? No excuse. Anybody in the room ever served in the military, you never saw anybody offer excuses better than somebody in the military, huh? Why didn't you? That's all. There's always a prepared answer. And let me tell you what, when you're in the military, so it reminds me of this commanding officer had a bunch of GIs who went out on leave, okay? There was five of them, and they went out, and uh, they were supposed to show up at muster at 7 o'clock in the morning, the next morning. Well, he called roll call and not one of those guys were there. In fact, the first guy didn't show up till 7 p.m. that night and that commanding officer was furious. And he goes, how do you account for being so late? And he goes, well, last night, sir, I went on a date. I lost track of time. I missed the bus back to base, so I hired a cab. Well, about halfway here, the cab broke down. So I walked a couple miles, found a farmhouse. I convinced the farmer to sell me a horse and I was riding that horse when it died. And I hired the last 10 miles and I just barely got here. The next guy shows up later. Same story. Has a date, missed the bus, hired a cab, cab broke down, bought a horse, horse died, had to walk it in. So he hears this one, two, three, four times. And finally, at 10 o'clock at night, this other GI shows up. And then by then, the commanding officer has just about had it. And he goes, do you want to explain to me why you are so late? And he goes, well, sir, last night I was on a date. And I lost track of time. And I missed the bus that comes back to the base, so I hired a cab. And that, and the guy, and the commanding officer goes, "What?" And the cab broke down. He goes, "Oh no, sir, the cab didn't break down. It just we had to get through all these dead horses on the road." <laughs> There's always an excuse, isn't there? No matter how brilliant the excuse may sound, the fact is the guilt remains. This man was speechless. And on that great day, when we face the king himself, if we are not clothed with Christ, he's going to ask you, why, friend, are you not clothed with Jesus? And if we can't say a reason why, we too will be speechless. Why? Well, because we need God's clothing, that's why. It goes all the way back. It goes all the way back. It goes back to the very beginning. In 
In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve have broken the single one commandment that God gave them to not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate the fruit. What's the first thing they realized after doing that? They were what? They didn't know that before, did they? Now they feel naked, exposed. And so they hide themselves. They lost their clothing of innocence. They lost their clothing of purity. They lost their clothing of righteousness the moment they sinned. And we, like them, oftentimes try and cover all that part of us uh, uh, our own way. And I've always thought, I've always imagined that when God appeared to them and that he rebukes them, it, it says later on in, the, in Genesis 3 that God provided for them what? Animal skins. Now, I've always imagined that, that Adam and Eve watched God sacrifice an animal in front of them, skin the animal, and that skin provided their clothing. Now, that's not in the text. It's, it's just my imagination. I don't think that God just said, oh, you're naked, camel hair suit. I just don't buy it. I don't. He covered them with the skins of animals. Where did the skins come from? I think he called animals to them. And he, they watched that happen. Because from that moment on, it makes it clear in the Bible that sin is only covered by what? Sacrifice. And if that's true, God did indeed uh, cover their, their nakedness with skins. Maybe that explains why we call them hides. All right, here we go. I want you guys to play that back on YouTube because that was a pretty good joke. All right, anyway. <laughs> God's grace provides the covering we need for our sins. God's grace is custom fit for us. There was an executive who uh, was having throbbing headaches and his throat was all uh, throbbing, his vision was blurred, and he went to the doctor and the doctor ran some tests and he says, well, it looks like you're terminal. You've got about a month to live. So he cashed in all his IRAs and all his CDs and all this stuff. And he, he says, I'm going to live this last 30 days the way I've always wanted to. And one of the things he's always wanted to do is have some custom-made shirts. So he went to Patrick James, purveyor to gentlemen, and he had some shirts measured. And so the guy was running the tape down the arm and down around, you know, and he put the tape around his neck and he says, 17. And the, guy, and the, and the, the executive says, no, no, no. I wear a size 16 shirt. Okay, sir, let me run the tape again. Runs the tape around his neck. Uh, sir, the reading I'm getting is a 17. He goes, listen, I've been wearing a 16 since I got out of college. And the guy with the tape said, well, sir, if you wear a size 16 shirt and you have a 17 neck, it'll cause blurred vision, throbbing headache. <laughs> Grace is custom fit for us. It's custom fit for us. It fits us so well. And um, speaking of clothing, the New Testament makes it clear that we must be clothed when God looks at us. He doesn't just see us and our sins, but He sees Christ on us, right? Galatians chapter 3, it says, You are all sons of God through faith, right? For all of you who have been baptized into Christ have what? You've clothed, you put on Christ. It's a clothing that happens at the moment of salvation, the moment that we are baptized. Hey, when the prodigal came home and he, and he confessed his sin to heaven and to his father, what's the first thing his father commanded be done? Very first thing. Get the what? Which robe? The best robe. Get the best robe and put them on it. Why? Why was the father so uh, demanding that his son, who came from this long walk, we suppose, and this long journey in, in, in filth and whatever he looked like after feeding pigs and walking all that journey, and he came to his father, and the, the father said, the first thing we got to do is what? We've got to clothe him. 
We've got to cover all that sin and all that dirt from the sin. We've got to clothe him and we put the best robe on him. Because he's not a sinner, a prodigal. He's my what? He's my son. He's my child. And my children don't look like that. Same with God. So on that great day, because this wedding feast uh, is a metaphor of the judgment day, on that great day, we must be found not only uh, it, having the right attire, but wearing the correct attire. Okay? It's not enough that we know where the clothing is. It's not enough that we have the clothing hanging in our closet. It's not enough that we wear the clothing once a week on Sundays. No. Many are called, few are are chosen you see it's not that we know about it and that we can get access to it it's that we wear it daily and that we are found wearing it when we find ourselves in front of God in this passage the Jews were invited but but in the end they're rejected and it says the king came in in verse 11 and he came in to look at the guests. This word look means to uh, carefully contemplate and investigate. And our entrance into heaven is going to depend on whether we know about the garment of Christ and whether we have found the garment of Christ and whether we have put on the garment of Christ and listen to me now and kept on the garment of Christ. The garment of Christ. It's not that we have found it and it was placed on us after baptism, but we are wearing it daily and we are found in it on that final day. I thought it was fascinating that back in the first century in the days of Rome, if people were applying for office to run for office, they wore white togas or white robes. The, the, the Latin for white robed is candidatus. We get our word candidate from that. Those who are seeking to run for office wore white. And candidates for heaven are also going to be wearing white. As we look in Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 4. He's writing to the church in Sardis. And in, and in Revelation 3 and verse 4, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy, it says. Verse 5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels only those who have overcome the world by the power of God's gift. Only those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and in this metaphor, Jesus is saying, are clothed in white, which stands for purity. Only those who are wearing white, only those who will be in the book of life, and only those confessed by Christ are the ones who will be enjoying that day. In Revelation 22 and verse 14, it said, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and go through the city gates. You want to be wearing the right things. And you can't pretend that you are one when you're not. My mom's favorite cartoon of all times was the Roadrunner show. She never got tired of watching Wile E. Coyote trying his way to get that Roadrunner. And so, one of the ones that I remember the most was when Wile E. Coyote ordered from Acme a Roadrunner costume. And so he got the costume, opened it up, he put it on, and he went up to the Roadrunner, and the Roadrunner said, hey, follow me, in his own way. And so they're running along side by side, and you know, and you can see Wile E. Coyote, he's trying to keep up with them, and, and he's thinking about, I'm going to jump him, I'm going to get him, I'm really close. And they went up over this hill, and over the hill was 
was about a hundred coyotes. <laughs> the roadrunner looks at Wiley Coyote in costume and goes, meep, meep, and he's gone. And Wiley Coyote is standing there, and there are a hundred coyotes going, and he's trying to take off the costume, but the fasteners aren't working, and then, you know, it fades off, and you see all the dust and all that stuff happen. And it kind of reminds me of people who are trying to fake it, but aren't going to make it. You see, you can fool people in church. You can fool elders and preachers. You can fool their wives. You can fool anybody in church. You can fool them. Like everybody know, oh, I'm Christian. I talk Christian. I, I, I act Christian when I'm here. I say Christian things. I answer Christian questions with Christian answers. See, we can do that here because we ourselves can be deceived by people in costume. But friend, there is someone you'll never fool. And if you want to go to heaven on that final day, you must not only know about the right garment, which is Christ, but be found wearing the right garment. And nothing else will substitute. Amen. I love that song in the hymn book, uh, Oh, I want to see him and look upon his face. You know, if Myron did anything for us during the lectureship was to get us to pay attention to the wording in the hymnal. <laughs> what, what, what's going on with that hymn? You know, I, I knew that when I asked Myron to come out, he wasn't going to be a musician who was going to technically tell us how to do our parts. That's not what he does. What he does to say is this, this is what this song is really about. And when you sing it, you know, here's how to sing it the right way. Oh, I want to see him and look upon his face. There's somebody there is like going, I'm done with this in here. I want to see him. I want to see him face to face. Right now I'm walking by faith. I want to walk by sight. I want to see him. I want to look on the face of Jesus myself. There's that longing, that desire. And I was thinking last week as I was preparing this, it would be beautiful to write a song that would describe someone who's lived a long Christian life and they are finally in the presence of Christ and what happens then. That, that perhaps Jesus would go up to that, that uh, Christian and um, ask them for the garment they've been wearing. The one they received at baptism. The one that is worn from use. The one where the, the knees are tattered from prayer. The one that, that has been uh, 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 ripped and cut by attacks from Satan and yet stitched up by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus asked them for that, that garment that he gave them the day they were saved. And, and then he sends an angel off to go to a closet, to a, to a rack. This rack would make Nordstrom look like Goodwill, right? And grab a garment off of that rack and bring it to Jesus. And Jesus would then clothe them with a brand new outfit. I see that happening. There are other songs that have already talked about this great time. One of them is the one we're going to do as an imitation song. I'd like you to stand and sing with me if you have something you'd like to share with us today. If you need encouragement or prayer or maybe you want to put on Christ this very hour in baptism and he put on you the clothing of Christ. Let us know. This is, this is the day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's stand and let's sing. Beautiful.